recording because I want to make sure that we can provide this to families who weren't able to hop on tonight. So the reason for this meeting, um, we're meeting tonight to share our plans and how we arrived at them. And we are also meeting so that we can hear your concerns and your ideas so that we can refine those plans ever better. Um, as, you, uh, as you probably know, uh, from those of you who might have uh, friends who have children in other schools, um, certainly around the Bridgeport area, we're pretty early in getting our guidelines out. And that's partly because we wanted to get as many people to have input on that process as possible so that we can make the best decision we possibly can by the time, uh, by the time uh, school is ready to start. So we are not an open or bust situation. Our goal is to open in the fall to in-person learning, but that can change in a moment if the information at any time warrants that a move to distance learning is the right thing to do. What this meeting is not is a suggestion that we have all the answers, and it's not a forum to convince you that you must send your children to school in person. We as an academy have deliberated based on the research that we have done and as a community of school leaders and we, we agree with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the uh, Center for Disease Control that where risk factors can be reasonably mitigated, the social, emotional and psychological benefits for children to re return to school is the goal that should be striven for. Um, but again, if we feel that we cannot mitigate those risk factors to a communally acceptable degree, then we will revert to distance learning whenever it's necessary to do. So a couple frequently asked questions. Um, the one that we get a lot is, will there be an online only option for families who do not wish to send their children to school in person? So the quick answer to that question is no. And the reason for that is, is we simply do not have the infrastructure, the staff or the faculty available to do that well. Um, in, order to, in order to do that simultaneously, let's say that. So we can't provide an in-person program in which we are doing our very best to educate our students and simultaneously provide an online option as well. Um, as those of you who are part of our academy in the spring know, distance learning is very different than, um, than just sort of having the assignments on Google and the kids sort of handle it on their own. Our teachers were teaching. They had to lesson plan very differently. The process for engaging students online is, is very, very different and it requires um, a whole different approach. So to ask our teachers to somehow figure out how to manage an in-person experience and a robust and authentic dynamic um, and, and um, effective online program at the same time, we just don't have the faculty and staff um, that would allow us to do that. So what we're going to do and when we get into the guidelines uh, a little bit more, we'll talk about what happens if a, an individual student or if a class has to switch over to distance learning or if they have to uh, be gone for a couple of weeks because they need to quarantine and what the difference between those things will look like. Um, there are online only options. There are uh, Catholic online only options that have, that have existed for, for years and years and years. And, and that is an option for families if they feel that that's necessary. We unfortunately just didn't feel that we could do both well. And that's, that's actually a, a decision that, that we made as an academy and the entire diocese uh, made as well that um, we could have, I can tell you that, we certainly could have because I think that probably would have made the most amount of people happy. But um, as usual, our goal, uh, our decision making isn't about what's going to necessarily be the most popular, but rather what we believe in our hearts and with conviction that we can do well. And none of us felt that we could do both of those models at the same time well. So that, that was the decision making factor for that. Another question that we have is, will families be notified if there is a COVID-19 case on campus? Um, absolutely, uh, they will. Um, what we will do is uh, that is specific to a confirmed case. Um, that is part of the process and the protocol that we engage in uh, with the community that if there is a, a, a positive case of COVID-19 on any of our campuses, our families will be um, notified. And then we also have to notify, there's a whole protocol for notifying um, health agencies and government agencies in the area. So that's, that's definitely part of that. Um, we might not be able to, we, we will not be able to give you names. We're not going to say Angela Poland has COVID, everybody, you know, run. That's, it's a HIPAA thing, so we're not going to give out names. However, uh, uh, we will be able to let you know if there is, is a confirmed case. And I say confirmed, I specify that because 
Um, there are going to be lots of times when we're going to ask folks to go home and quarantine because we suspect COVID. Um, and there's going to be lots of those people who are going to go home and quarantine who did not have COVID. So we're not going to be able to let families know every time we send someone home. Those of us who have children know that kids spike fevers for no good reason. They get tummy aches, they are not, their noses run, their eyes water, they cough. Um, there's all kinds of reasons that kids are going to need to go home sick. So we're not going to be able to notify you every time a child is sent home, but certainly every time we have uh, um, a confirmed case that will that will be made known to the community and there's a whole protocol for what happens at that point and we'll get into that uh, as we go through the guidelines. Uh, another question I've, I've gotten quite a bit is my child or a member of my family is in a high-risk category is it safe for us to return to school in person? Um, my answer to that is I would highly suggest that uh, you you take the guidelines uh, for our school and, and share them with your physician and have that conversation with your physician. Um, the guidelines are gonna be changing. And as a matter of fact, the guidelines that I'm gonna be going through with you tonight have changed since we sent them to you last week because more information has been made available to us. So I will be sharing with you what those changes are. Um, and then we will be, we'll be sending out that uh, document um, tomorrow through your principal so that you have the updated version. So I would highly you know, suggest that you are always engaging your physicians if you have um, uh, health issues that, that you feel really you know, could impact your decision, bring your physician into that conversation. Um, I would also say that um, while we are not going to uh, be able to allow families to sort of just decide they don't want to come to school in person because they're just, they're not comfortable with it because we can't manage that. If you have a, a health issue that precludes you from your, or your child from being able to come to school, I want you to engage with your principals on that because there might be, again, it wouldn't be a distance learning situation. It might be the same situation that you might have if a student had a very severe broken leg and had to stay out of school for a couple of weeks and what we would do to sort of manage to help that child, you know, get their homework and, and sort of, and stay at school. So it wouldn't be a distance learning situation, but uh, you might be able to work something out with your principal. It's going to entirely depend on the resources they have at their disposal, who the teacher is, et cetera. So please let us know if, if you have a circumstance and it will need to be verified by a doctor. A lot of what we're going to be talking about, um, you know, there, there needs to be medical documentation from a medical doctor, an MD or a DO. And Lou, this is your heads up that I'm going to be throwing it to you here in just a moment. But the other question that comes out quite a bit, and this is a big one, um, is how exactly will the schools be cleaned? So I will, uh, I will toss that very important information to you, Mr. Pereira. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. So um, just to give you a little background, we, uh, besides doing a lot of, uh, of the schools, Catholic and, and other private schools, we do a lot of uh, medical buildings, surgical buildings, uh, breast cancers. And a few years ago, we started using uh, products that the, uh, the hospitals insisted we use. And uh, it's Virex, it's a product called Virex and then another product called Oxivir. Um, so we use that for cleaning at the schools as well. The, uh, the Virex is a, uh, is a cleaner and uh, it, kills, uh, it kills a lot of the viruses. And then the Oxivir is a wiper, that, a wipe that we use down that kills any kind of uh, viruses within 30 seconds. Um, now, I know that most of your schools have day porters uh, as well, so we're kind of going to be supplementing them and at nighttime, hitting all the touch points, uh, deep cleaning up the bathrooms. We're going to be using the Firex, and then sometimes it's a little bit of overkill, but we're also going to use the, uh, the, uh, the Oxivir. So deep cleaning of any touch points, all the desks we're going to hit at night, um, and then deep cleaning of the bathrooms and the hallways and basically all the touch points. We're going to be using HEPA filtered vacuum cleaners, which trap doesn't uh, put things back into the air. Um, and if you have questions, I mean, if you have questions for me, I can uh, answer them as well. But be, 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 be assured that uh, it'll be deep cleaned and be ready for the children in the morning. So I'm also, when I spoke to, uh, to Pam about it, I told her that all the stuff that we bring in, the Virex and the Oxivir, your staff are more than welcome to use as well which is great, thank you so much. And we're also gonna be, um, uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we've, we've sort of enhanced in our program. So Lou, pop in as you, as you feel the need, but uh, we have also purchased 16 portable hand washing stations, soap and water hand washing stations. So we're going to um, uh, have those in the hallways uh, of all 
uh, four of our campuses um, because while the sanitizing stations, Purell stations are, are great and they're important, the virus uh, is, not an, is, is not susceptible to an antibacterial. So really the best way to keep our kids safe is to have them hand washing with water and soap. So we purchased more um, uh, portable hand washing stations. Um, we are going to have all of our uh, day crew on a rotating schedule to, um, to uh, clean and, and disinfect and sanitize all of the communal areas. They're going to come through each classroom once a day as well. They are going to be doing uh, the playgrounds as well. We've purchased four hydrostatic foggers and maybe Lee, you can explain what the hydrostatic foggers do. Sure. They're, they're, um, it's, I also own a gym in New Milford, Connecticut and I bought one of those about a year ago. They're, they're, I believe the ones that you're going to use are like mine. They're, they're non-toxic, non-corrosive, so they can't do any harm to anyone. Uh, at my gym, for example, we, we spray that during the day. People are working out and we spray it into the air. Done tons of research on it. There are some that are based with chlorine that you cannot use while people are in the building, but I believe the ones, and speaking of Pam, the ones you purchased are the ones that are, that are uh, non-toxic. Non That's right. Uh, it's, a, it's a great product to use. When we've done... 59 um, coronavirus uh, uh, confirmed case cleanups in, in, uh, in some of our medical buildings and also in some of our um, manufacturing plants that we clean. And what we do is we go in there. So if you, in case you do have a case, what we do is we go in, we obviously we use the virus and the Oxivir to disinfect the room. And the last, the last stage is to spray the, uh, the electrostatic uh, cleaners in the room. Usually within, within, so if we do that at night, and I've done research on this as well, if you do have a child, God forbid, that, that uh, should contract it, we come in, you, you, you close off that room, we come in the, that afternoon or that night, disinfect it completely, use the fogging system, next morning it's ready to go. It's been totally decontaminated. Great, thank you. So our, our goal, and I see that some of you have raised hands, and unfortunately, because you have so many participants, I can't actually see who's raised a hand. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is use that chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and there will be time at the end of this for Q&A. Um, so if, you, if you'll indulge me, we're gonna try and get through sort of our portion of it. So hang on to your questions, write them down, or go ahead and use, them, uh, use the chat function. And that's the best way to share your question as opposed to um, asking it out loud because we have so many uh, participants. Um, so yes, the, um, the, we, our motto uh, for moving forward is going to be sanitization and separation. Uh, we are going to sanitize and clean everything on a regular basis. We're going to keep our, 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 uh, everybody in the building masked and socially distant. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the research that we've done, not only um, you know, domestically, but internationally, and, and the um, suggestions and the guidelines given to us by other, um, by other agencies. So uh, we feel very strongly that with Lou's help, uh, we are going to be able to uh, really keep the sanitization part is, is, is pretty locked in. And that's gonna be happening on all four campuses at that level of diligence. And so we're, we're pretty, we're feeling very, very good about that. So we're very grateful uh, for your expertise and, and everything that you're providing to us. Um, the eternal caveat, uh, it's always the caveat in schools, uh, in Catholic schools, that um, the plans and protocols that we're putting into place are those that we have determined are in the best interest of the widest range of our community. However, individual families must always make the decisions that they feel are in their own best interest. So that's just something that we, we are aware of. We respect um, families' uh, rights and abilities to make the decision that are in their best interest. Um, understanding that sometimes that might conflict with what the school has deemed as in the best interest of the, of the wider community. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we determined that we were going to reopen. We participated in a reopen task force with the Diocese of Bridgeport that uh, consisted of uh, principals and school heads across uh, the Diocese of Bridgeport, as well as um, experts in various, um, in various aspects, such as cleaning, such as um, you know, uh, folks who had uh, um, uh, backgrounds in epidemiology, et cetera. Um, and we all just sort of worked through the process together of what that might look like. Um, we did independent research on school openings, both domestically and internationally. We were part of uh, webinars uh, that were put together by different organizations uh, that, that put us in touch with people all over the world and what their reopening procedures look like. We actually were really impressed with one person um, 
uh, Shirley Jacobson, who runs the Rygaard School in Denmark. So uh, Susan Ciceri actually reached out to her and asked if she would indulge us in a Zoom call so that we could pick her brain uh, with a little bit more detail. And she indulged us, which was wonderful. So we spent about 45 minutes with her, uh, where we learned what was helpful for her with the things that she said, this is going to be really important for you. This didn't turn out to be as big of an issue for us, etc. And so a lot of that information was very uh, helpful. Now, Denmark ha has a very different infection rate, um, but they've also kept their infection rate down as they've, as they've returned to school and, and opened businesses and things like that. So we felt it was, it was good information for us to add to the wealth of information that we were uh, putting together. We had, uh, of course, we've been in consultation with local and federal government health agencies. We've been on websites. We've been doing our research or reading studies. We reviewed all of these guidelines with our faculty and staff cab wide because obviously keeping our teachers and staff safe is also a primary concern for us. Um, and they have had opportunities to give input and feedback and they are uh, very much on board at this point with, uh, with what we've put together and, and are eager um, to find a way to get back into the school as well. However, this is all ongoing. The task force is not done. We're not done doing our research. We're not done consulting with letter, uh, local and federal government agencies. We're not done talking to our faculty and staff. This is a constant process, but these are sort of the four bullet points that we're constantly referring to as we uh, make our decisions. This is also a little uh, flow chart that the CDC provided uh, for schools, uh, school administrators, as we started to think about uh, the process of reopening. Um, so as you can see on the far left category and far left column, should we consider reopening? Will reopening be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Yes. Is the school ready to protect children and employees at higher risk for severe illness? Yes, and we'll talk about uh, what we're doing to, do, to, to, care, to take care of those folks. Are you able to screen students and employees upon arrival for symptoms and history of exposure? Yes, so we moved on to the next column. Um, our, recommendation, our recommended health and safety actions in place, will we be able to promote healthy hygiene practices, hand washing, employees wearing cloth face coverings as feasible? You'll see that the, the, the CDC all, ends almost all of their sentences with if feasible. Um, so we, you may find that a lot of the things that we're doing are a little bit more stringent than even the CDC suggests at times because we can be and, and we want to start off very, very strict at the beginning because it's easier to loosen guidelines than it is to tighten them back up. So we're going to start very strong. Are we intensifying our cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation? Yes. Uh, will we be able to encourage social distancing through increased spacing, small groups, and limited mixing between groups if feasible? Yes. Are we going to be able to train all of our employees on health and safety protocols? Yes. So we move on to the next column. Is ongoing monitoring in place? Will we develop and implement procedures to check for signs and symptoms on arrival? Yes. Are we going to encourage anyone who is sick to stay home? Yes. Do we have a plan for students and employees who get sick? Yes. Regularly communicate and monitor uh, developments with local authorities, employees, families regarding cases, etc. Yes. Uh, will we monitor students and employee absences and, ha absences and have flexible leave policies and practices? Yes. Uh, are we ready to consult with local health authorities if there are cases in the facility or an increase in cases in the local area? Yes. So we were able to say yes to all of those things. And so according to the CDC and uh, many of the guidelines that we're following, we are um, encouraged to, to, if it is our choice to, to open, we should open and continue to monitor. That continue to monitor, again, is that flexibility piece. We could be day three and something tells us that, you know what, we need to move to distance learning. It could be month three, it may never happen, but we all need to be flexible with the idea that no decision that we make is gonna be written in stone. We have to monitor the situation. We have to be reflexive and responsive to the information that comes across in order to make sure that we're doing our very best to keep everyone safe. So at this point, I would like to go through the guidelines um, and I'm just gonna pop up here really quick and I see that we have, um, uh, a question. And again, I'll, I will definitely get to these questions. That there will there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. Um, and we will talk about how the instruction will look inside the class, definitely. So thank you. All right, so we're just going to open these guidelines. These are the guidelines that were sent uh, to our families last week. Um, and I will skip past our my, my little intro there, and we'll just go right into these guidelines. Um, and, and we're just gonna go through them in a little bit of detail with you. And certainly our principals, uh, if you guys wanna pop in, Lou, if you have, if you notice anything that you wanna pop in for, please don't hesitate. 
So our arrival and drop-off procedures, the goal here is that we want to avoid bottlenecking of, of anybody into any one um, entrance. So all of our schools are gonna be utilizing as many entrances as possible. Um, the specifics for each of your campuses will be sent out to you through your principals um, in the coming weeks. So these are our, our wide uh, overarching guidelines and you'll get special information about how it's gonna look at St. Andrew, St. Anne, St. Raphael, St. Augustine from your principals soon. But the, the, the basic concept is that we want parents first and foremost um, to check their children's temperatures and watch for symptoms of COVID-19 consistent illness. And there's a link here for you uh, from the CDC about what those symptoms look like. We want you to self-isolate and report any potential COVID-19 illness. Um, and I'm gonna stop there for just a quick second. And you're gonna hear me say this a couple of times. And that is that you're gonna see that we have, if you've read these guidelines already, we are putting a lot of things into place. A lot of things. As a matter of fact, when we had our meeting with the teachers last week, I told them, put, put academics aside for the first four days, five days, and let's just practice what it is to be around each other. Practice what it is to navigate the building, to make sure that you know classes are taking their turns in the hallways, that we understand how to get in and out for recess, that we understand how to do lunch. Take our time and do it well and build confidence amongst all of us you know, again, if we start, we want to put that focus on, on just the, the logistics first. Having said that, everything that we do is going to be completely dependent on how each of us individually in this community handles ourselves outside of this building. If you are really good about, you know, having your child wear their mask and then on the weekend, you know, you guys go to a crowded beach and, you, you know, uh, you, you go to a, a cookout with family members that you don't know if they've been, you know, uh, quarantining, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it, it loosens, it weakens um, the efforts that we're all putting together. So our community, as always, is only as strong as we are individually. So we're going to really put the emphasis on being honest about, you know, if you think you were exposed, you have to let us know. If you think your child might be sick, you have to let us know. And we understand there can be huge ch challenges with, with people who need to go to work and, and all of that. And, but talk to us, let us see if we can help you. But the, the option cannot be to send a child to school if you suspect that they might be ill. Um, we have to work together on this process um, as much as possible. Or if they've even been exposed to a family member who might be ill, we have to really communicate. Um, each campus is going to designate multiple entrances and exits uh, to be used. If a child uses exit A on their campus, they will use uh, entrance A, they will use that same door for their exit. And again, the teacher, the principals will help you to understand how um, drop off and pickup are going to look. Um, we are going to have a, a coordinated schedule by class for which entrance to use. Students riding buses will have faculty and staff on hand to guide them to their designated areas. Faculty and staff will be on hand at the designated drop-off times and classes will have marked areas where students you know, need to wait so that they're maintaining social distance. Rain locations um, will be made available um, on each campus uh, in case they need to be outside and they can't come into the building right away, we'll have a rain, a rain space that will allow for proper social distancing and will also be cleaned. Um, students will have their temperatures taken with a non-contact thermometer as they enter the building. Every single student, every single teacher will do that before they start their day. So when they come in in the morning, so a lot of schools are doing things like, you know, they're asking families to sort of write down, you know, keep track and let us know. Early on, we're just going to do it. We're, we're going to ask you to do it too, <laughs> um, so that you maybe don't send them to school if they're sick, but certainly um, if they get to us, we're going to be uh, checking their temperatures. Um, and it's gonna be the same teachers at every entrance. They're gonna, you know, we will, we will um, record anybody whose temperature is abnormal or, or anybody who we um, observe as, as potentially having um, signs of sickness. Um, and we will refer them to um, either send them straight home if mom and dad are still there or if they need to go to the nurse's office. And I'll stop there for a quick second. Um, as you know, our nurses are, are, are provided to us through uh, Bridgeport Public Schools. And Mrs. Griffin might be able to speak to this a little bit, um, but we we have to find out still from Bridgeport Public Schools how how many hours we're going to get from all of our nurses and what those days will be. 
However, we already know that we're gonna be supplementing that with certified nursing assistants, CNAs. And then again, thank you to Mrs. Rowella who worked tirelessly to make that happen. So we are gonna have a, a certified nursing assistant on every single campus for the first three hours of every single day. Um, if we discover that we need them longer, then we will do that. Right now, we're trying to sort of balance everything, um, but we, th we wanted them there at the beginning of the day because we thought that would be our opportunity to really make sure that we're catching kids before they come in and really enter the building um, and, and, and uh, interact with their, with their friends and teachers. Hopefully, we can catch in the mornings um, students that need to go home. Um, we also have a telehealth program that is going to be made available to all four campuses that's been made available by the Diocese of Bridgeport. So every single campus is going to get um, a, a special a computer essentially, um, some diagnostic equipment that our CNAs and nurses will be able to use. As families, you will give your permission if you want uh, your children to be able to access this. It is free, um, there is no charge to families, and it is with a, a local doctor. So we are going to be connected with a local physician who, if we um, have any concerns about um, anybody, a student, um, a teacher that might be exhibiting symptoms, we can utilize that telehealth uh, program um, or uh, to, to access a doctor, a physician immediately and, and help us to make uh, you know, good decisions about whether or not somebody needs to go home, but whether or not somebody needs to go see their physician, et cetera. And we'll get into, we don't have all of the information on that from the diocese yet, but as soon as we do, we'll get that information out to all of you. Um, students would not be, um, you would not use that without your permission. You're also welcome to be uh, present in the nurse's office while your child is being um, um, diagnosed by a doctor. Uh, online. Um, so again, you know, this is just another way that we can offer um, consistent support or, you know, intensified support for you if that's something that you would like to take advantage of. And, and we certainly encourage you to do that. Um, so the goal will really be uh, to try and catch students at the door if we feel like there is somebody that shouldn't be coming into the school. Um, the uh, students will be dismissed from the same door they entered at the beginning of the school day. Students riding buses will have their own waiting area monitored by staff and will maintain social distancing. Parents will not be able to enter the building right now until further notice. We are gonna ask that you drop your students off at the door. Again, our goal right now is going to be to absolutely monitor and maintain everybody who's in our building. Um, and so we're not really, you know, going to be having volunteers We're everything's going to be internal right now. So you're, you know, bless your teachers, pray for them, your faculty, your staff, your principals, because they are all taking on an awful lot. Every single teacher now has morning duty. Every single teacher has afternoon duty. Every single teacher is going to be helping in myriad ways. And so, and they're on board. God bless them. You know, when we had our meeting with them, we were sort of like, what do you think? <laughs> and they were like, all right. Sounds good. You know, God bless them. They are the hardest working people in Bridgeport. And so I think that uh, I think that we're we're we, we're in wonderful hands, but we would appreciate you understanding that unless we call you in, unless we call you and we need you to come in, you know, directly to the nurse's office or something like that, we are going to not allow families to just come in and drop things off and volunteer in the classroom, um, walk the kids up to the classroom. They need to be dropped off at the door. Students will be picked up on time every day. Um, that's really important. Our after school programs will no longer allow for drop offs. We're going to get into the, our after school program a little bit later in this conversation. Um, students who are not picked up on time will be brought to a designated waiting area. They're not going to be able to sit and play like they used to with their, you know, go into after school and, and play with their friends. They will sit where they are going to be able to maintain distance until they're picked up. So it is really, really important, again, that we're coming together as a community, that you pick up your children on time unless they are part of the after school program. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to say that if you don't need to use the after school program, we really highly encourage you to make arrangements so that your children can go straight home. That is the safest thing. You know, if we want to try and just sort of make it so that school is sort of the one place where they go, um, if you can manage it, I know not every family can. Um, and we're going to try and, and, and provide some after school help for families that need it. But if you can spend this next month and a ha half arranging so that your children don't have to use an after school program, whether it's ours or, or Sheehan or the YMCA, um, if you can just sort of make school the one place you go and then go home, I think that is really um, uh, the, be the best chance for, for us to, to maintain the integrity of, of, a, of, a, um, of a safe environment. So we're going to talk a little bit about our learning, our indoor learning protocols. All the adults in the school will wear masks at all times. That's for their safety and to also to make sure that they're not uh, spreading any germs. 
students in grades uh, K to eight are going to be wearing masks at all times. I say encouraged, but we are really going to be having them wear their masks at all times. Um, there are going to be some kids who might have exceptions. Those are gonna have to be handled on an individual basis and a doctor will need to be involved. If you, you know, tell Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes, my, my daughter just can't wear a mask. He'll say, okay, please let me see your doctor's note. Um, we, we just have to be that strong and that forceful about it. Um, preschool, Sister Mary Alice, unfortunately, is, is having technical difficulties hopping oh, on, but yeah. she, I'm oh, is she there? Oh, there she is. Hi. So I you can actually, there. God bless you. So you can actually talk a little bit about, you know, you ran a preschool of over 250 preschoolers when you came uh, in New York, yeah. and uh, you were talking to us about how even those little guys were wearing masks. Yeah, I was in the Bronx up to about a week and a half ago, and all the parents who came to register and bring in the enrollment papers, everybody had a mask on. Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, you walk down the streets, every child and every adult has a mask on. And they kept them on the whole time they were there. If they were outside filling out papers for an hour, the children kept the masks on the whole time. So it can be done, but that's why we ask you to start now practicing mm -hmm. with your children. Let them wear them in the house all day so they get used to it. That's very important. And mm -hmm. they can do it because I've seen it done. And, and, you know, obviously we know that a, a long day, a six, seven hour day is, is a different thing. So teachers are going to be able to help, you know, give kids opportunities to go outside and, and lift their masks and do those kinds of things. But, but Sister Mary Alice is 100% right. We really want to come, we really want to start this as stringent as we possibly can. Because again, it's easier to loosen those regulations than it is to tighten them back up. Um, and, and, and absolutely, starting that process now is a really important one. Um, Students have to wear masks uh, whenever they're present in any indoor common uh, school area, obviously at arrival dismissal. Um, some of the schools that we talked to internationally um, said that once they were in their desks and facing forward, they allowed students to take masks off. They didn't start that way, but they got to that place pretty quickly. We're gonna have to see. So we're gonna start off with always with masks and then we will reassess as we go. Um, the way that we were able to maintain uh, distance between students is that we have begun the process of removing every single bit of extra furniture out of every single one of our classrooms, bookshelves, bins, oh, that fun whatever table that some teacher brought in 20 years ago that's been, been in the classroom all that time. Everything has been removed um, so that we can separate desks as much as possible. Um, the CDC suggests six feet. Um, that's obviously the word, we, the, 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 the number that we, we keep hearing. If you take a look at those guidelines for businesses and schools, they say wherever feasible. So um, one of the things that we learned in a lot of the studies that we looked at, um, um, the, the head of school in, in Denmark noticed this as well, or shared this with us as well. They started off with, you know, very, very stringent six feet. Um, they found that studies are showing that even as low as three feet, um, if you keep the masks on, the hygiene and all of that, it, it's starting to, it, you're, 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 you're receiving the same benefits as the full six feet. So in every single classroom, we're able to get to at least five feet. Um, some classrooms, um, uh, most classrooms, six feet, but from seat to seat, we're, we're no less than five. The diocesan guideline is nothing lower than four and a half. Um, and so we, uh, we manage that by getting rid of all the extra furniture. The kids are going to be in, in their seats facing forward um, because we don't want them facing each other um, like they do in the little small groups you know, where they're chatting. One of the things that the CDC guideline uh, mentioned is that um, it can take up to 15 minutes of just regular sort of conversational talk less than six feet without a mask for, for, for the virus to sort of uh, to be transferred. So we really don't want kids facing each other. Um, and that's why, again, they're always going to have masks and stay separated. So sanitization and separation, that's, that's the rule. That's the, uh, that's the, the motto. Um, we want um, whole class hand washing is going to be written into the schedule. Um, so it okay, it's fourth grade's turn to go and wash their hands. It's going to be part and parcel of the, of the whole uh, culture of the place now. Um, students are not going to be moving from class to class until further notice. Um, they're going to occupy one desk and one seat for the duration of the day. It's just the best way that we can sort of maintain that they're, they're um, exposed to the least amount of, of touching of common areas. Um, middle school teachers will move from class to class in order to teach their subjects, and they are going to pretty much, again, stay at the front um, the, the, uh, so that we're not having um, adults that have access to every single kid. So a lot of our specials are going to be done um, remotely, so we have them 
uh, at some of our schools, uh, it's going to depend on the on the teacher and the situation. But one school we have, um, music is going to be taught remotely, so that students are going to be watching a video, and the and the and the um, the teacher, the classroom teacher, will be the one sort of facilitating that. If we do have someone coming into the room, again, they're not going to be. If it's a specials teacher, they're not going to be um, wandering around amongst the kids. They'll be up at the very front, well well beyond the six foot range with a mask, um, and they're not going to be interacting closely with the kids, that would only be the, the, the homeroom teacher. So we're keeping kids in, in small class cohorts um, to keep them from, from mixing and interacting so that we can keep track. If someone does get sick, we, we wanna try to be able to isolate that as much as possible and just you know um, uh, um, reduce any opportunity of students getting sick. Um, so again, the specials are going to look very different and our, our principals will be able to, you know, give you specifics as to what that's going to look like um, on your campus. Um, art will be taught in the room. Um, each student's going to have their own materials. They're not going to be sharing materials anymore. PE, again, might just be, you know, taking a walk outside. It might be, you know, doing some stretches and yoga. We're not going to be doing um, games where they're playing with each other and have contact and, and, you know, breathing hard around each other. The idea is we want them up and moving, but we don't want them, um, you know, exposing themselves um, through heavy breathing and, and hard work and bumping into each other and sharing of PE equipment, etc. The campuses are going to coordinate movement of classes through the hallways to avoid multiple classes navigating narrow passages. Students are going to maintain six feet distance from each other while in common areas as best we as we possibly can manage it. Again, that's why the masks and the hygiene is going to be so important. Um, hallways and stairwells that can be made one direction only will be. Um, they're not all possible to do that. So that will be, you know, that's where the coordination of uh, when classes are going to be moving down hallways will be important. The nurse's office will be maintained for students with severe injuries or sickness. All other bumps and bruises will be handled at the front desk. And we know that 90% of our, of our illnesses at school tend to be the, you know, I need a Band-Aid or, you know, can you see it? It's right there, I promise. Can you see it? Uh, and so, you know, only the really, really sick ones are going to be using the nurse's office. And that's our way to, to isolate um, potential illness. Enrichment programs are going to be suspended until further notice. Um, and after school care. Um, we are going to be having after school uh, care um, on our campuses. Um, St. Augustine will uh, likely not can have after school care. Um, it hasn't had it before. Uh, that, that community has used the Sheehan Center. Um, and so it's likely that we might not be able to do that. But um, Dr. Hurt, I know, is exploring um, the possibility of having a late pickup. So you might be able to have students waiting until three o'clock. Uh, if, if you're just if you just need a little bit of extra wiggle room, you know, to get your students picked up. Um, but I will say that on all four campuses, um, there will be a limited amount um, allowed in after school and and your your principals are going to have to look at uh, a few factors and that's going to be um, uh, How many faculty and staff they have able to run the program and how to do that um, safely because we will not be able to have an after school program just for first grade and just for second grade and just for third grade. So our after school program will have to mix students. And so we're going to have to keep them separate. So like, for instance, in St. Andrew, you know, um, uh, Mr. Holmes is looking at using the, the downstairs cafeteria area for after school. So the classes would still be separate. He has room down there to still keep the class, you know, the ages separate. Um, uh, so, it, you know, long gone really are the days of them all, all you know, playing together in after school. Um, and hopefully that, that will be able to return someday soon. But right now we're, we're really just trying to maintain that cohort. So after school is going to be focusing on, you know, letting them get their homework done and basically waiting to get picked up. Um, we, we just kind of can't have the, 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 the play after school, you know, portion um, as it's looked before. So your, two, your principals will get those details to all of you again in the coming weeks. Um, and we really encourage you, if you can, just kind of go straight home if it's possible. We again, I am very well aware that that's not possible for some families, and so this is the this is the service that we'll be able to provide for you if it really is a necessity. If you're looking for a fun after-school environment for your child, this probably isn't going to be it. But we certainly can provide a safe place, or or at least you know a um, a safe place for them to be and wait, not play necessarily for you to pick them up. 
recess protocols, the campus is going to be divided uh, amongst the play areas. And so again, the, the principals are going to rotate classes utilizing uh, different sections of the playground. So maybe on Mondays and Wednesdays, fourth grade uses the play structure. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's fifth grade, you know, they're going to, or they're going to organize it so that every day, um, uh, one area is utilized by a class so that when uh, Mr. Pereira's group comes in and they and they help and our and our our uh, custodians then come in at the end of every day and clean you know it's good to go the next day and we're not we're not cross contaminating with different classes. Um, students will be asked to wear their masks if they're playing in a manner that precludes social distancing so if you've got a little guy who just sort of wants to play hopscotch by himself you know, he, he, it's, you know, he can talk to his teacher and he might be able to take off his mask for a little while, but if he wants to sit, you know, you know, with, within six feet of his buddy and, and, and just sit and chit chat, we're going to encourage that he obviously keeps his mask on. So we're just, uh, we're, we're really going to, to try hard, you know, they might have time to take their masks down to get a little time off with their masks outside. We're also going to encourage our teachers, as long as the weather's fair, to teach outside. If they can get out of the classrooms and do their teaching outside, we're going to do that. Take Chromebooks out um, and just, just be outside as much as we possibly can. We're going to keep the, the ventilation um, really open in the rooms. The windows are going to be open. The doors are going to be open. We are not going to be using air conditioning and fans. It is, it is really not um, uh, the conventional wisdom right now to have artificial airflow in buildings. So, of course, the question is, oh, my gosh, it is going to be so hot on the third floor of St. Augustine. And, oh, my gosh, it's going to be. And it will be. So we're going to look at, you know, making some adjustments to the to the uniform. Maybe we allow the kids just to wear their PE uniforms, you know, until until it starts to get cold. Um, and if they don't have PE uniforms because they're too little yet, you know, the, you know, we'll start making we can make adjustments or, you know, keeping their their uh, their shirts untucked. You know, the kids at my old school would are, are, are probably, you know, hearing this somehow they're going, wait, she's letting them walk around untucked. I suggested they be untucked. Um, but yes, you know, we just want them to be as comfortable as possible. And the uniform is not the priority right now. So if we need to, if we need to make some adjustments to the uniform so that they can be, uh, you know, comfortable in, in an otherwise hot room, um, then we're, we're of course going to do that. And again, if we can keep them outside and, and do as much work outside as we can, we're going to do that too. Uh, lunch protocols. Lunch is going to be eaten inside the classroom. Uh, students will be encouraged to bring their own lunches if at all possible. Um, but if they take part in the lunch program, then those will be brought up in bins and the teachers will distribute them. Um, and as always, really, food should not be shared. We went through the custodial protocols, um, so I'm just going to skip right over that for now. Again, visitors, uh, if, if we do have a necessity for a visitor, if we call you and say your child's in the, in the nurse's room and we need you to come, you must wear a mask. You may not come into the building without one. Um, so we know for at least the first three weeks of school, we're not going to have any volunteers. We just, we, we just we want to get used to the new normal, and then we'll decide how we need to open up, open up things. So here's a question I know that a lot of people are, are eager to know. What happens if we have a student that's sick? So this highlighted portion is new. This is not in the, in the guidelines that we sent you last week. And again, this is, you know, as, as things change, we're going to update our guidelines. In the case of a confirmed case of COVID-19 on campus, uh, we will take the following action. The building will close and transition to distance learning for between two and five days. And that is not because we're worried about cleaning it, as Mr. Pereira said, you know, he, they will come in and do an intensive cleaning. It'll be ready to go in terms of sanitization the next day. But we also want to see about community spread. We want to see if, if anybody else happens to um, present with, with symptoms. So we need to stay closed for a few days to see if that's the case. We will be, of course, um, in, in consultation with local government and health authorities to determine that. I, I don't have the qualifications to make that decision on my own, so we'll be talking with the proper authorities. If after this period in consultation with health authorities, no other cases arise, um, schools will resume in person with all protocols back in place. Um, if there seems to be a community spread of the virus, then we will have to reassess and we'll have to decide if we go to distance learning you know, and for how long that will be. Um, so again, I, 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 I want to stop for just a quick moment. And I know we're going very quickly. And I know folks have questions. Um, there's so much to cover. Um, I wish I could give you very definitive black and white answers to everything. Um, and so what I know you're hearing a lot of is, we'll have to see, or we're going to have to re reassess, or we're going to have to reevaluate. But really, if I told you these are the things we're going to do and you will 100 percent be safe i would clearly be lying to you um i have no desire to um to sugarcoat any of this 
Um, this is, these are the guidelines that, uh, you know, again, every, every, every answer, every question that the CDC or the health agencies ask us in terms of, are we, are we able, you know, we're, we've purchased plexiglass dividers, you know, for bathrooms, we're purchasing, um, you know, like I said, the hydrostatic foggers, we didn't get one, we got four, we got one for every campus. Um, we, we are really, we, we purchased masks. Every one of our students is going to be given a, um, a reusable mask. You can wear whatever mask you want to school, but we're giving you some so that you have them. We are also going to be having a, a ton of uh, disposable masks because we know that our kids can't remember to bring their belts. So they're probably going to forget their masks. So we're going to have masks for them. We're going to help in every way conceivably possible. Um, and uh, and if it gets to a point where we feel like it's not enough, then we will we will move to distance learning. But but from everything that we've learned and everything that we've seen, these are these are solid protocols that are going to go into place that will allow us to be uh, in person. And in the case of a suspected case of COVID, and, and this is why we say this, we don't know what testing is going to be like. We don't know how fast people will be able to get tests. We don't know how fast they'll be able to get their results. Sister Mary Alice has a lovely story of, of getting her test and it taking over a week for her to get her results. And so, you know, we just don't know how that's going to look. So we're going to have to really ask you if you're, if your child is presenting with symptoms that are consistent, we're going to ask you to go home and to stay home. And according to the CVC, CDC, um, they can come back if, uh, if they are suspected as having COVID-19, but it never got confirmed. They have to be gone uh, between 10 and 14 days. They have to have three days with no fever and all of their respiratory symptoms have to be gone within that time. Uh, and then they're able to come back. And again, in order to come back, you have to have a doctor's note. So if you go home for the flu, if you go home um, for allergies, you have to have a doctor's note to come back. So that's why we say if you if your child has allergies, if you if your child has has pre-existing conditions that that has them coughing or has them have you know watery eyes or maybe is susceptible to fever, you need to give us that information. And again, it's got to be documented by their physician. Give it to us now so that we have that information to work with, and it'll help us to determine um, if your child you know is just having their regular allergy. Uh, reaction or if they potentially might have um, other symptoms that are more worrisome. So you need to get all that for information to us. But if we ask you to go home and you go to your doctor and your doctor says, oh no, these are, these are definitely allergies and you got your COVID test and you're, then you can come back before that 14 days, but you can't come back without a doctor's note. Um, students set home, uh, um, uh, again, um, with, with a test uh, um, is once you go home, you have to have past 10 days since your test in order to come back. And again, you have to have your doctor's note uh, to come back. All of this is, is really lands to the, the importance of, of family self-reporting and self-isolating. Um, don't try to get around these, these rules. Don't send your child to school with Tylenol in the morning to, to, to hide their fever. It doesn't help you, it doesn't help us, and it just really, really makes the, the waters very murky. Um, um, and so, you know, we, we talk about if you've been in close contact with somebody, um, that's if you were within six feet of someone who has COVID-19 for at least 15 minutes unmasked, if you provided home care, so you can go through all of these things here in the guidelines to know, you know, whether or not you should self-isolate or, 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 or um, report to us. Um, if a student has to be home for, for that 10 days to 14 days, um, all of our teachers are going to continue to use Google Classroom, um, very similar to the way that they used it in the spring. It is not going to be distance learning, though, where they're, you know, every, every Tuesday at 10 o'clock, you're going to have your math class, et cetera. It's going to be very much more similar to what always happened when your child had to stay home from school and maybe they were gone for three or four days because of the flu. And so, you know, they needed to get their homework, you know, maybe a friend or a sibling brought their homework at the end of the day. And if they were feeling well enough to do the work and then they would do it and turn it in, it's going to be similar to that, but a little bit more effective because we're utilizing Google Classroom. Um, videos, uh, assignments will be able to be posted online, students will be able to, you know, turn work in online, so it'll be a much more interactive experience, but it will not be distance learning, because as I explained before, it's not a model that we can support simultaneously to in-person in learning. There is a possibility that we might ask an entire class to quarantine if we feel that that's necessary, and again, in consultation with um, health authorities. Or we might shut the whole school down. You know, again, if we have a, if we have a um, a positive case, we might have to go. Uh, the whole school has to close. Then 
we go to distance learning, not just Google Classroom, you know, access. So it's going to really be on a case by case basis, um, but we do have, you know, clear guidelines for what we're going to do um, uh, based on the situations as they arrive. Much of this is the same for our faculty and staff. We're asking the same things of them. If they have to leave, they have to come back with a doctor's note. They have to, they get their temperature checked at school every day. Um, we're not really asking for people's word that they don't have fevers. We're checking it ourselves, those kinds of things. And then lastly, we really just ask that, that you comply with this, that if you're going to um, make the decision to send your child to school at the Catholic Academy of Bridgeport, that you're going to encourage your children to wear their masks, that you are not going to insist on coming into the building and walking your kid to kindergarten and, and all of those things. I have every expectation and hope and prayer that if things continue to go well, eventually this will be a memory, eventually. How fast it's a memory, you know, not only in our community, but also in our entire, um, our entire country, it's going, to be, it's going to depend on how well each of us handles this individually. And so uh, we really ask that, uh, that you cooperate with us with these guidelines. And, and, and I, I, complete, I have a child at the Catholic Academy of Bridgeport. I have an eighth grader, a child going into eighth grade. So I, I, I share so very many of your concerns and I understand, you know, I look at my kid and go, you better wear that mask. Um, you know, and so I understand, I understand the challenges of, of, of all of this, but um, we have to cooperate with each other. And again, it's better to start off very strict and loosen things later than it is to be too loosey goosey um, and then not, you know, and then have to, to tighten things back up. So that's, whew, that's our guidelines uh, uh, in a nutshell. So now what I'd like to do is to take an opportunity to, to answer your questions. Um, we're going to talk, uh, and again, I see that there are, um, it's going to take a look. Okay, here we go. I got the chat. Got it. Um, so one of the questions is, can we talk a little bit more about small group instruction in the event of a school class closure? Will kids be grouped by similar learning level within the class who will teach these group sessions? So if, if the school or the class has to close, then the teacher will run it like distance learning like they did before. So they, they will be, if, if fourth grade has to isolate, um, and go home for a couple of weeks, then fourth grade will be taught through distance learning by their fourth grade teacher, much the way it looked um, in the spring. If an individual has to go home, they will be, they will be helped individually. Um, and and I, I should also mention too that our, our aides, our front office staff, everybody's job descriptions is getting a little reallocated. They're, they're gonna be there to help call, you know, if, if, if Angela has to go home because uh, we suspect that she might have COVID-19, um, then, you know, if I'm at St. Anne, then maybe Mrs. Mantero is calling me in the mornings to make sure that I know what I'm supposed to do and do I have any questions. So we're going to have a lot of support uh, or, or, or maybe one of our teaching assistants might call just to ask if we have any questions. What do you need? Do you, do you understand what your homework is? Those kinds of things. But if we have to go to actual distance learning, it'll look very much like it did in the spring. Your classes will be together. Um, let's see. Uh, let me see, go through some of these. Uh, will the children get masks? Yes. Uh, mask breaks? Yes. We hope so. We, we know so. Those will happen outside. We're really going to ask them to have any mask breaks outside. So when they go to recess, um, you know, we'll separate them. Uh, we actually had a, a session at, at St. Anne recently where we had some, uh, invited some families to come and, and take some pictures so we could show some people what, what it was going to look like. Uh, we had one of our teachers, she was brilliant. She was like, all right, you have to pretend like you're in a bubble and no, nobody pops each other's bubbles. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Uh, and, the, and the kids were pretty cute. And, and it was, sometimes they were better than others. Um, but but generally when they're outside, that'll be the chance that we'll give them to do their mask breaks. Um, and I also think that if, if it's a rainy day and we're not getting out, we'll be creative. Maybe fourth grade goes up to the gym and just everybody takes a corner and a side, you know what I mean? And everybody stays 10 feet away and takes their masks off for a little bit. We'll, we'll, your teachers are going to be able to help to make sure that your kids' needs are being met. Um, would it be possible for parents to get a tour of the school? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that question. Okay, I would have forgotten it and I would have been so mad at myself. Um, yes, all four of our principals are going to be getting in touch with all of the families and you are going to be invited to come in um, a few weeks, a couple weeks before school to go into your child's classroom 
and have a presentation by your principal so that you will be able to see for yourselves what the classrooms are going to look like, um, what the distancing is going to look like, all of that. Uh, you know, so so yes, absolutely. We're not doing it yet because we're still moving things out of the rooms. Um, we're still setting up our rooms. So we want to we want to invite you once once the rooms are going to look the way they they are going to be for your children. But we are going to invite you for a presentation to do that very thing. So great question, and I'm so glad you asked it, Gladys. Um, temperatures, I think the question is, are we taking temperature? And I did answer that, Lisa. And um, we're, we're gonna get some more guidelines from, um, from the nurses about wh what are reasonable temperatures you know, for kids. Little guys, sometimes little guys run a little high. So we're, we're really gonna make sure that we understand what is an acceptable uh, temperature. These, thermo, these thermal uh, thermometers that we're using um, basically give you a, a red, yellow, or green indicator whether or not you know uh, you're good to go if you get yellow or red that's going to be when we're starting to, to to take notes and pay attention to to what's going on it might be referred to the nurse um i hope i answered your question lisa um, if a student is sent home to quarantine how is that going to affect their grades and attendance before a student comes back to school from being quarantined are you requiring a negative covid test so um absolutely we are going to help students uh, you know I, I will tell you that generally um for any any documented medical need to be gone, don't worry about um, attendance. Just don't worry about it. We're gonna work with you on that. Uh, again, with grades, we're going to be able to, um, through Google Classroom, be able to still, and again, like I said, whether it's the front office staff or one of the, the, the student, uh, or one of the teaching assistants, we'll be calling students to say, hey, do you know what you're supposed to be doing? Do you have any questions? And as always, teachers will be able to be accessible um, to help as well. So uh, hopefully, you know, you will see that there won't be an impact, a negative impact to the grade, but also, you know, if during that time it's the science fair, we're not gonna hold that against you. We're gonna work with you. We're gonna make sure that, you know, if you just, if you can't get that volcano project in, then you just don't get it in, that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna make, a set, you know, we're gonna make adjustments. But at the end of the day, we don't wanna ding anyone um, because they were being safe and quarantining and then they turned out to not be sick we're not going to make your grades go down as a result of that. You know, that's just pedagogically horrible. <laughs> so um, we will make sure that we're working with you. Um, and that's why communication is going to be so important. Uh, before a student comes back from school, uh, to school, are you requiring a negative code? And that's why we'll need the, the doctor's uh, certification um, um, that says that you're free to come. We don't just want the negative test. We want to hear from the doctor that, you know, you've, you're, you're ready to come back. Um, yes, Susan, if you wouldn't mind, showing them what the complimentary masks look like. Um, Mrs. Cesiri has an example of what our masks look like. And if she speaks, and then the, there you go. Then the- Yeah, they're extremely comfortable. Um, they're very soft cotton, very comfortable to wear. And every style, uh, every child and faculty and staff member will be getting two of these um, complimentary from us, um, thanks to the generosity of a, a donor. So yeah. Yeah. So they're a little, you know, you might have to adjust them for the little guys, put a little knot in the back. But again, if, if you prefer to wear a different mask, that's totally fine. Um, another question I've gotten is, are, are students allowed to bring their own hand sanitizer? Sure. They just can't share it. Um, and again, keeping in mind that Purell is different than an antibacterial is not an antiviral. So Purell is great, but hand washing with soap and water is where it's at. And that's what we're, we're really putting a lot of emphasis on at the school. Um, when they go outside, are they going in small groups? Yes, Diana, they are. They're going to stay in their in their school cohort or their class cohort. So again, if they're in fifth grade, fifth grade is going to go out and play with the fifth grade on section A of the, and it's going to sound crazy and very regimented, but here's the thing. Um, our kids can do it. They, they can get used to it. I worked at a school where we had major um, uh, building happening. Uh, we were building a whole, a wing to one of our buildings and, and it chopped up a big portion of our, of our playground. Um, and so we had to rotate kids through, you know, not everybody's going to be able to get onto this part of the field, you know, and it took them a couple, took them a couple days, but th they got the hang of it very quickly. And, and we just want them to stay kind of isolated in those small cohorts. So yes, they will stay in small groups, even at, even at um, recess. Will students' asthma inhalers also be held at the front desk or homeroom as opposed to the nurse's office, or they will still go to the nurse for treatment? That's a great question. We want to keep that nurse's office um, really, really separated. Um, so I, I believe right now we're going to look at that ha being handled at the front at the front desk. Um, but you know, if you have specific concerns about particular administration, 
um, and you want only the nurse to do it or the CNA, the CNA would also be available. Um, you know, we can talk about that. You know, some kids can do their own asthma treatment and so they just need to have it held somewhere. But if they need help with an administration and you prefer it to be the nurse, again, I'm just gonna ask you to talk to your principal to work out the details of that. But we, we kind of wanna keep that, that old school, that nurse's room kind of separate. And then um, the, the less, um, uh, what, what, what would you say, intense, issues, you know, sickness, we're going to, we'll have outside. And Sister Mary Alice, did you want to add something? We, we have one of our assistants who is an RN, so she will always be available to help with that. So parents can let me know that you want her to take the, to administer the inhalers if you want, uh, rather than a Mrs. B or myself. Uh, okay, Great. thank you. Thanks, Sister Mary Alice. Um, another question, would St. Augustine consider on-site after school as opposed to Sheehan Center to, to minimize students traveling to multiple locations? Absolutely. We're going to look into it. I will tell you that our plan was to do it for, for this coming year, and then March happened. Um, and so we just, we, our, our efforts to sort of bring something new, just it really, it was a little crazy. But I know that um, Dr. Hurt, we talked, we had actually had a principal's meeting, was it yesterday, you guys? I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Um, but yes, we had a principal's meeting yesterday where we were talking about that. And so um, I think that, you know, we can certainly explore it. It's going to depend on whether or not they can get somebody to staff it and what that would look like. Because uh, right now our, our St. Augustine faculty are not used to running an after school program. So it would be a new thing for them. And so we don't have people in place already. Um, at the very least, I know, um, and I don't want to speak for you, Dr. Hurt. So, you know, feel free to, to, to chime in. But I know that she's definitely you know looking at do we look, do we do at least a a late pickup if not a if not a full after school to 5 30 uh, because we would probably be able to manage that you know uh, somewhat better but I tend to agree with you if we can sort of keep our kids you know at school and home that would that would be the ideal scenario um, so, okay, so the question, can I choose not to send my kids? I'd rather distance learning for a number of reasons. Oh, I, I, and I completely understand. And, and as I said, and I did mention this at the beginning, um, Kamara, that, that unfortunately we just don't have, we don't have the resources to manage both. We can't have an in-school option and a distance learning option at the same time. We, we, we can't manage it and we certainly couldn't manage it well. So if we, if we decide, and I, and I keep saying if, because right now our goal is, is to start all, all things being, if, if, if tomorrow was the first day of school, these are the guidelines that we would be using to go to school. If something changes in the next month that tells us that distance learning is really the way we need to start the year, then we will make that decision. Um, so, so right now, these are the guidelines that would be in place if we are to go back to school, um, you know, looking that way. So if we do, if we go back to school, then everybody comes to school. Um, if we go to distance learning, everybody goes to distance learning. That's, that's the model that we're looking at right now. Um, um, because we just, we, we just can't do it. We can't do both. The, it would require the, the lesson planning that would be required of our teachers. It would be a, a, at least a plan and a half, if not two whole different kinds of lesson planning that they would have to be doing um, to really do that well. And, you know, it would also, it would almost have to happen after school. It, it, it's, it's a very, it, it's, it's very complicated and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do it in a way that we could say, yes, we are doing this well and our kids are learning and we're proud of what we're putting out. So um, we kind of have to do this all together. Um, now, next question, will meds or inhalers be in there? So, so I answered that question. Um, I'll, I'll let your individual can principles. Wait, oh, can please I go ahead. In on, yeah, uh, this ahead. is Pat. So um, I will tell you that uh, medication has to be in the nurse's office has to be in a file cabinet, it has to be locked. Right. Um, the, um, the other thing is, um, and I don't know if um, all of our schools, because we haven't talked about this piece, but St. Anne is going to have an isolation room, which is a second nurse's office, in case a child is very, very sick and needs to go there. And so the nurse will be in her regular office, um, and then she will switch to the isolation room should uh, she be needed to be with a very sick student. Actually, that so, makes perfect sense. Yeah. That makes perfect and, sense. And yeah. the other and the other piece of that is that, um, you know, our, our nurse at St. Anne is only with us two days. So as the principal of the school, I can administer medication um, with the doctors uh, and, and our nurses keep us really well informed and they have nurses binders where the doctor's notes come in. And so I'm the person at St. Anne who does the inhalers 
yeah. and things like that. So um, I and every campus has their person. Yeah. yeah, every right. campus has their person that can do it. Actually, that's a great point, Pat. And I think actually, and we'll talk about this as a, as a principal's group, that's probably the way to go is to, is to create a second room for, for the actual really sick kids and the, and the nurse's office is the typical one. Because you're right, yeah, actually like, coming coming from a different <laughs> state, we, we, we weren't required to keep things actually. Yeah. They could be also locked up in the front office. But so thank you for and, clarifying. I and appreciate I, and that. Unfortunately, it was at the um, demise of my faculty room um, that the uh, isolation room went in and my teachers are now downstairs in the art room. So oh, bless their the hearts. kind of accommodations that we're all making in our buildings, you know, so we're looking really carefully. So yes. um, I want you to know that, you know, we're, we're moving things around as needed. So Great. thank you. No, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. I appreciate it. Uh, Lisa, another great question is Chromebooks are current uh, Chromebooks are currently shared. Is there a possibility of entertaining of obtaining individual Chromebooks? Uh, they will not be shared next year. We, we are we are continuing to purchase more Chromebooks. Um, we will have enough for every student, certainly in middle school, where it will really be necessary um, on a daily basis. Um, and we have also, and, and I'll let you know, Susan or Pam chime in. I know we're continuing. We, we, we did a big push in, in spring. God bless Susan. Um, put, we did a big push for, for donations to get more Chromebooks, and she was extremely successful in that push. And Pam, I don't know where we are in, in the purchase of those at this point. Oh. Okay, but you can, if you want to type it in, if you want to type it in, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out to everybody. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, there you are. Oh, am I there you go. It? Yep. Great. Sorry, everybody. A um, little technical difficulty. Yes, we've had several do um, very generous donors um, come up. Our goal is to have one-on-one -on -one devices for everybody. We're there with the middle school. I've been working with the principals. We're getting ready to place another order um, in the next week or so. And um, we're really hoping if all the funds come in to have one-on-one, -on -one. start when you all start back on September. But we will, have a, we will have a method, no matter what, as Angela said, they won't be shared. Right. And they will be disinfected and that kind of thing. So, yes. Yeah, and, and that's one-on-one -on -one K to eight. Uh, and it's not necessarily Chromebooks, it could be tablets, tablets for the littler yeah. guys, but, but so, so between a tablet or a Chromebook, we, we're, we're striving for one-on-one -on -one availability. Not necessarily they'd have it with them all day, every day, but they would have it available. And certainly if they, um, when they're ready to go home, um, as, as we did in the spring, we would, we would help families make sure that they have devices and hotspots and, and all of that. So we're going to support you through that process. Um, uh, parents providing them with the school. Pro yeah, so, so I think that answered that question with the Chromebooks. Secondly, as a parent substitute teacher, will there be an opportunity for proactive voluntary training? Eventually eventually um, with regards to um, you know substitutes we're gonna have to sort of look at that um, I think you're looking at several of the substitutes now you know your principals myself um, you know we're, we're, we're gonna try to keep it as, as internal as we possibly can um, our teaching assistants are qualified to take uh, to take classes as well um, so I think we just kind of need to take it one step at a time um, but eventually yes we definitely want to um, you know train folks in, in the process of coming back into the schools uh, what is the procedure for lunch? So again, we're going to have our students sitting um, in their classrooms at their desks eating. Uh, we want them in their desks because that way we can maintain that six foot the five to six feet difference uh, distance. Um, if they are taking part in the lunch program, the lunch will be brought up by a uh, by a faculty member. They're all individually packaged lunches. They will be all individually packaged lunches. Um, and I can maybe ask Mr. Mr. Holmes to talk a little bit about this eventually, but we are we are moving to um, a standardized um, program for uh, amongst all four campuses um, uh, that we can uh, take advantage of the free and reduced lunch program as well. Um, and they will be individually packed and they will be sent up to the classrooms, you know, most likely probably in bins of some sort. And then the teacher will be responsible for making sure that they get administered in a, in a safe manner. Um, but we want them, we don't want them in the cafeteria right now. That might change, but right now we just feel like if we sit them in their desks, then we know that they're six feet apart. Um, oh, you're very welcome, Diana, for answering your questions. Uh, do we have a date yet? Um, I think you mean for the first day of school? Uh, it would be August 31st. Um, and so that is our goal. And, and the, the, the calendar will be coming out to all of you very soon. Um, so Kamara, yes, unfortunately, it's not that you don't, it's not that we don't want to provide you with options. We just don't have the ability to do it. We, we just don't have the ability to do both an online version and an, and a, um, and an in-school version um, together at the same time. We, we just can't do it. And, and I don't think what we would, what we would do if we tried it would not be 
uh, people wouldn't be happy with it. The quality would not be happy. If, if you're really looking for um, an, a, a, a strict online program, um, as much as I would, I would hate to, to direct you uh, outside of the Catholic Academy of Bridgeport, there are wonderful um, Catholic um, um, homeschooling programs. Uh, Seton Academy is, is a famous one that's, that's national. Um, th that they're set up to do that. They're set up to do essentially it's homeschooling um, because that's, that's really what it would have to be. It would have to be homeschooling because we couldn't do the distance learning piece. Um, and so, you know, it, it really just came down to resources. We, we just don't have the faculty to do it. Um, so there's that, that, that's why, that's why it's all or nothing. And please believe me when I tell you, um, it's not to our benefit to say that, right? Because we, we want to be able to keep everybody on and keep everybody happy. And certainly there's no great benefit one way or the other for us to choose to start off distance learning or to start off um, in person. The decision that we make is based on what, what, we, what we think is gonna be best for our kids. So we talk to our teachers, talk to our, you know, the, the survey that went out from the diocese a while back, uh, we got um, between our four campuses, about 70 to 80% of our families, and I'll, I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, we're interested in, in returning if at all possible. So that was, that was the original, you know, the survey um uh that that's you know that's what came back from the survey from our families so um so we had that going as well as just the belief that that learning in person is is better if we can manage it safely so that was our that was our 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 goal but you know again that could change and i see what you're saying you know is what whether or not your kids can handle the masks all day i can completely appreciate that um um, and that's why I would say if you have a, if you have a medical condition that, that precludes your child from being able to wear their mask, by all means, get that information from your doctor, talk to, um, you know, talk to your principal and we can make, you know, um, exceptions because if everybody else is wearing their mask and you have one student, we can maybe work where that student is, et cetera. Um, we can work with some individual cases, but they have to be, you know, medically documented. Um, and that's why I say that 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 caveat's an important one. We understand that these aren't going to be the, the best answers that everybody wants to hear. We understand. And I and I think I will tell you that if I were to say we are absolutely not coming back in the fall, we would have just as many families upset that that's the case because of of you know their feelings about the importance of being in school or or whatever their other challenges are. There is no way for us to to make a decision that that everybody's going to be happy with. So we really just have to move forward with what we think we can do well. Um, and we, we can't support both, both um, platforms together. We just, we just know that we can't. Um, Lisa, your question, um, how will charging stations be handled for the Chromebooks? Are the students, uh, um, yeah, the, the students, the charging stations, um, uh, again, every, every kid's gonna have their own Chromebook. The charging stations are in a large, um, large cart. Um, so that's, uh, that's really not an issue. If you wanna be more specific with what your question is, um, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, with regards to the, the, the station. Um, how are students, are the students gonna be allowed to socialize? Of course they will. I mean, kids, I will tell you, when we talked to the, to the, to the head of school at Rygaard Academy in Denmark, she said, um, here's something that we weren't expecting, so prepare. She said, get a lot of tissues ready because everyone's gonna be crying because they're so excited to be back. And, and we, are, we were on the call just going, oh, um, they're just gonna be so happy. And so one of the things that we're gonna do uh, at the Catholic Academy of Bridgeport to, because she also said that the little ones, of course, ran to their teachers and wanted to hug them. And so, you know, we have to sort of retrain everyone. So one of the things that we're gonna be doing is this is what a hug's gonna look like at the Catholic Academy of Bridgeport for the next several months. So we're, you know, start sharing that with your students that if they make a little heart with their hands, that's how we're gonna hug each other at the Catholic Academy of Bridgeport for a while. It kind of make, <laughs> chokes you up thinking about it, but um, they are going to be able to socialize for sure. They're gonna be able to play within their classrooms. Um, you know, and again, um, we're going to have to sort of see how this rolls, but I would say, you know, if we give, give us two to three weeks to assess it and to understand it before we can, you know, before we can make any big changes, but you know, they'll be in class together. They'll be able to interact together, um, without a doubt. Um, are we going to have a zoom meeting with the teacher since it's a new year, like a, the new teacher? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I'm going to leave that to the individual, um, Oh, how will the Chromebooks be sanitized? Okay, I'll get to you. Um, so to the question of, are we gonna have Zooms with the new teachers? Um, I'm gonna leave that to the individual principals to, to work that out on their campuses. But again, you also will be invited to come to the, to the campus uh, before school starts. And I know that the teachers will be invited to come to that as well. Um, so it'll, it'll sort of be treated a little bit like a, a back to school night. 
uh, a very abbreviated version of one. Um, but yes, what a great idea. I think, you know, your, your principals will make sure that you have an opportunity to meet, to meet your teachers. How will the Chromebooks be sanitized? Uh, will there be one person that will load them and sanitize them? I see. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure that that'll most likely, you know, we'll have to, you know, actually, I would love to talk with Lou about that. You know, I don't know if the, um, if the best thing to do would be to, you know, at the end of the day, leave them on their desks. Can they be fogged? Will, will we just ruin all of our Chromebooks? I don't know. So we have to, <laughs> we'll have to take a look at that. Um, but, but generally the goal is going to be with any materials. Um, the teachers will generally handle materials um, that need to be collected. So yes, it will be one. So we might have to work out. So thank you for asking that question. It's something that we will talk about in, in upcoming meetings. Do, what do you think, Lou, about Chromebooks? Got to be careful with that, with the uh, with the uh, the fogging system. I, I have to see what you guys are using. I do a little mm -hmm. research on that. But the Oxivir wipes will not be a problem for that. Oh, great! It's just a well, quick that's good. wipe, and you're good to go. Oh, great! Good. So what we could potentially do, and I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head right now, we'll we'll work it through. You know, you could have at the end of the day, every child wipe off their own toss away the wipe, then it just stays on their desk and then it's the teacher, you know, with her gloves and she puts them into the, into the charging station and then you don't have to worry about a bottleneck at the charging station. You know, it's one, one way to approach it. Uh, with everything being back in order, can we please get to the school supplies list early? Bless your heart, Angie. Um, I think as soon as we get a sense of that, I think actually a lot of, a lot of the teachers probably already have their websites um, with their school lists. Um, but some may not. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll, again, I'll have your principals reach out to you with when you can expect those school supplies. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question because we really are gonna be asking kids to provide their own materials. We're not gonna be, you know, this is gonna fly in the face of all those years of would you share your crayons? Not anymore. Um, so we're gonna ask them to not share so much. Uh, we're not gonna have, you know, a teacher supply of pencils anymore. So if they forget their pencil, they're not going to be a bunch of pencils up that they can return. You know, there might be some pencils that the teacher can give them, but but we really do need kids to be pretty good about you know keeping their supplies. So we'll try and get that to you, Angie, as, as soon as we possibly can. Um, any other questions? I'm just checking the time here really quick. We're at 6:50. My goodness, I did a lot of talking. I am very very grateful um, for all of you for 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 bearing with us with this this conversation. Uh, would there be more than at a private school teachers prepared a warm introductory letter? Oh yes, absolutely. I'm sure you know we'll we'll have uh, a lot of you know a lot of the the back to school um, protocols and and those good old procedures will still be happening. It's 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 still really mid July. A lot of that stuff usually happens um, you know once August rolls around and you you know the teachers are coming back. Um, so yes, I'm sure you will get um, you will get letters from your teachers and an opportunity to meet them. Um, will there be more than one date or set time for the before school tour considering social distance? Um, Gladys, so the question, that's a great question, but I think what, what, we're, um, what we're going to really want you to do <clears throat> is see what it will be like to be in the classroom the way your children are going to be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I think that the idea just is, is that if we're going to ask 20 of your kids to be in the building and in, in their classroom, we want you to be in there to see what that's gonna look like. So if like, for instance, if two parents, if a mother and a father, you know, you might wanna tag team it in the hallway or that kind of thing. Um, but, but with regards to extra dates, just in case somebody can't make the date, you know, that might be something different. It might be, a, a, you know, the, the presentation um, that, the, that the principal and the teacher will do is probably gonna be a, you know, a one-time opportunity. But if you can't make it and still wanna come in, by all means, contact your principal and come in and take a look at, uh, you know, and, and schedule an, an individualized tour. Um, but this is your opportunity to sort of have a, a presentation from the principal, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Um, Chandra can, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, can parents still donate cleaning supplies? Of course, yes, by all means, we will not say no. Um, absolutely, yes, yes. Um, you will rarely hear a Catholic school leader say, no, we won't take donations or uh, volunteer time. <laughs> so uh, the fact that we're asking you to not volunteer as much, by all means, make up for it in extra wipes. All right. 
So everyone, um, I know this was a lot to process and you will still have questions. Um, I, a few people uh, uh, sent email um, questions and I, I endeavored to, to answer those questions um, early on. So please continue to send your questions to us. If after you're thinking about things like Lisa's question about, hey, how are you gonna sanitize those Chromebooks? I don't know that we thought about that exactly yet. So these kinds of questions are really helpful. They allow us to, you know, all, all these different perspectives just give us all that more, much more opportunity to think of, Think of everything. Um, so, you know, if you want information on on anything that we've talked about today, reach out to your principals. Um, if if you you know you need to reach out to me, you're very welcome to do that. Um, but you know, if you want specifics for how your campus is going to run, your principal's the person to talk to. Um, if you have questions about what you know, what maybe what a good online program might be in an interim, I'm I'm happy to share that information with you. Um, you know, again, it's it's. We don't say any of that lightly because we obviously it's our goal to, to make everybody happy, but 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 we know we can't do that. The situation is not one that we chose. It's certainly one that's been imposed upon us. And so we're going to we're going to do with our resources what we think we can do best um, and without lying to you and telling you that, we, you know, that we can do it and then it won't look good. And then people aren't happy, you know, with, with the product. So um, this is this is where we're headed now. Um, if there's any big change, um, we'll call another meeting. And again, as the, as the buildings start getting, the buildings are all in, in a major a disarray right now, um, which is why one of the reasons why we didn't try to have an in-person meeting even in this situation, because um, there really is no place for it right now. Um, but eventually, you know, if there are changes, we'll either call another Zoom meeting or if we can meet in person, we certainly will. Um, you know, we will, we will keep you as, as informed as we possibly can um, with everything that we're doing and just know that your children and their teachers are our absolute first priority. Um, and, and we're not going to make any decision that, that we think is going to be, um, you know, out of the gate of failure. So your, your, your communication, your input, your ideas, your thoughts are so very welcome and really so very needed. Um, so please continue to do that. Uh, last question, if a student already has a Chromebook and, and want to bring to school, would that be allowed? Yes, Gladys, you asked such good questions. Yes, they are certainly welcome to bring their own Chromebooks to school. The, the challenge with that is, like whenever we bring a valuable thing to school, <laughs> I see, see Pat smiling, um, whenever we bring a valuable thing to school, there's a good chance that that valuable thing could be damaged. And so, you know, if, if we can go one on one and give you our, our Chromebook, maybe that's the way to go. Um, but I'll, I'll, you know, we can talk about that individually. Um, um, and I think you're probably thinking that way they're not touching two Chromebooks, but we'll keep them sanitized. I think it sounds like, you know, those wipes will, will allow us to do that very easily. Um, I would just hate for you to bring, you know, something, something valuable and, 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 and it's not covered by the school's insurance like our Chromebooks are. Um, and, but anyway. and the, taking out of, the taking out of Chromebooks out of the cart, at least this is the way I am thinking at St. Anne, is my teachers are going to wear gloves and they're going to be pulling them out of the cart yeah. and handing them off to a student. So it's not going to be a, a, a group of students going up one at a time right. and potentially taking the wrong number or right. things like that. So, um, you know, there has, um, we can handle the cart. The carts are going to stay in the classroom. And if teachers uh, wear gloves and hand it off to the student directly, they're all numbered. Our students always use the same number. Um, and that's how we know who's on our Chromebooks. Great. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, along, you might be more comfortable with that, uh, knowing that up front. Thank also, you. along with that, uh, there's, there's more specific software that is on our Chromebooks that allows the teacher to kind of monitor exactly what's happening on a Chromebook mm -hmm. in a classroom. Mm -hmm. That's true. So if you bring That's one true. from home, That's a good point. Uh, you, I, I'm more comfortable with giving, lending your child, having your child use their own dedicated Chromebook every day at school from us, because then Good to point. be honest with you, we monitor that and can make sure nothing's going awry. Not that they ever try to watch YouTube during a, during a class or anything like that, but yes, that's a very, very good point. We can monitor that much better. You're very, very welcome. Uh, I have a couple more questions uh, that I just want to address before we go. One question, which is a very good one, what happens if my child's teacher gets sick? Um, the same situation will happen with regards to the teacher's protocols for leaving. Um, if uh, that might be a situation where we would have to quarantine the whole class because that teacher had access to every student in that classroom. So I'm just, you know, let's say it's the second grade classroom. Um, then, then we, you know, again, we're going to be in consultation with our, um, with our health authorities to understand, you know, the best way to do that. Um, but that would be with a, with a confirmed case. 
Um, and that would mean that, you know, we might be, the whole building might be shut down for five days, but maybe that class would, would stay home for the full two weeks. You know, we would have to look at that. Um, we would be able to get a substitute, you know, we would make sure that that substitute, you know, had testing and, and was able to, you know, come into the building and work, you know, uh, on a regular basis with us, um, et cetera. So does that answer your question, Kishanda? I think that um, it, the idea just would be that, you know, the whole school, if we have a confirmed case of COVID, the whole school shuts down for a few days so that we can see, you know, if anything spread. The rest of the school could come back, but maybe that class might have to do the full two weeks. We would we would have to take a look at how that would work. Can you talk more about the one to one or small group differentiated instruction twice a week during distance learning? Um, so uh, again, it would look very much like uh, the way that it looked in. Uh, and, and please, the principals can can pop in and and um, add to this as well. But uh, the small group, the way that the, the things were differentiated during um, during the distance learning in the spring where, where teachers could do breakout rooms, um, they could work with individual students at different times. You know, again, you had certain times of the day where kids had to log on and then other times of the day where they didn't have to log on, but sometimes teachers worked with students during those times. Um, so that will look very, very similar. And, I, and I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question, but Pat or Jean, if you, if you wanna you know, talk about what differentiated instruction looks like during distance learning. Um, it looks different uh, grade level to grade level. Um, what we did um, from April through um, June, um, teachers, some teachers did one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction, some teachers did um, only small group instruction, and some teachers did full class instruction. Our teachers really have a whole array of things that they now know that they can do, and they are still um, having uh, professional development towards getting to know more. And so I would say that um, should we go to distance learning again, there will be a lot more interaction with your child and their teacher, um, depending on the grade level. Uh, Pre-K is its own animal. As you know, they can sit still for about three seconds and then they're on to the next thing. And so we do our best job with them, but there would be um, the uh, opportunity to, um, to probably uh, differentiate in a different way than what the differentiation was um, before and the small group was before. Mm -hmm. I want to just say, you know, we were, the te we had a very good experience coming out of the spring. You know, our, our teachers, there was a big learning curve because nobody had ever done anything like that before in, in their teaching careers. But we were able to pull off, particularly in the primary grade, small group reading instruction uh, very often. And that's what we, you know, like right, you know, in the in the in the real classroom, uh, we would do groups of three or four children, uh, similarly grouped by ability, mm -hmm. um, and you know, when we would work with them, well, we did that online. In fact, in I got to tell you, the pre my pre K people were able to actually do. I had the two aides and the teacher each took little groups of kids, and they did like breakout sessions for reading. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they practice their sight words and all that good stuff. We did the same thing with kindergarten and, you know, and, and it happened all the way up. And the older kids would, would have, when the teachers would have, quote, office hours. Mm -hmm. And what, so what that meant was that after the whole class instructional time was over, they would be there on the Google Meet and work with kids in small groups or individually as needed. So it worked out really, it worked out as well as it could. I mean. You know, again, I, let me just say, um, I mean, it, it, we had about a 90 to 95 percent daily participation rate in, in, in the distance learning program. So, you know, and that was phenomenal. When I, when I find out what was happening across the state, you know, we blew them out of the water. But, I mean, but there's no substitute for getting the kids back in the room together, you know, like, because to do that DRA reading assessment, you really need to be with the child to do that. Uh, and you need to build up that rapport. You know, I mean, because think about it, when the kids left school in March, they had known those folks for, you know, since September. So, I mean, at least they had a relationship with the teacher already. Right. You know, so, I mean, if we can get, you know, I'm really praying every day that we can get you know, a good chunk of time under our belts before there's any kind of disruption so that the kids and the teachers can build those relationships, yeah. especially for our new kids. Yeah. We got to get them in there. We got to get them to connect. 
Yeah. And then if there's a disruption, right, then they know, oh, there's Mr. Holt, you know, it, it, you know, that, that, and we're going to teach them how to mute their mic the first week of school, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I've got the tech, you know, that's I already the tech teacher. So the kids are going to learn how to use those technology. You know, they're going to be on that tech device the first week of school just to, yeah. you know, but so yeah, please, as yeah. prepared as we can be. Absolutely. And, and, and that's a good point, Mr. Holmes. Thank you for mentioning that. We, we, are, we are going to operate with the understanding that we may have to go to distance learning at any time. So we're going to start off the year making sure that kids have their access. They know how to access Google Classrooms. They know how to log on. They know what their passwords are. Like you said, I know how to use Google Meets and how to, how to, how to mute myself and all of that. We're, we're gonna do, that's going to be part of that, that training early on. Um, another question from Chandra, would it be possible for students to take the Chromebooks home each day to charge them so they can be used the next day so that Chromebook contact would be decreased? You know, my, my suspicion is that if we're able to, if, we're, if we feel comfortable, uh, as Mr. Pereira mentioned, you know, that we're able to sanitize them properly, again, they would not be the one, you know, putting anything in and they would make sure that that, um, that, that the teachers would make sure that the correct uh, Chromebook goes to the same child every time. I will tell you, coming from a school where we did allow students to bring their Chromebooks home, those chargers rarely made it back. Um, and it was, uh, it, it could be a real challenge sometimes, you know, because then if, 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 the, if the Chromebook doesn't, you know, we, oh, I forgot to charge it. Oh, I left it in the car. Oh, I left it at grandma's. It, it really starts to turn into a problem of whether or not they're going to be able to access it. And it's going to become more and more important for them to be able to access their Chromebooks during the day. So I think if, I feel very comfortable that if we know that we can sanitize them well, um, and the teacher, the one teacher, the teachers are the ones putting them into the carts and taking them out. I think we can uh, still maintain that only a person, only one teacher with a glove and your student will be touching a Chromebook at a time. They won't survive the backpack. They won't. <laughs> they, they, those Chromebooks will not survive a, a, a boy's backpack. We're also There's trying no... to limit the exposure. Right, uh, we so can't. We're home, uh, good we're point. We don't know the exposure. Who, yeah, that's so, exactly right. So we can yeah. keep it. That's a very good point, Pat. So we can keep it, the integrity of the exposure better in our classroom. If distance learning gets put into place, can they follow a full day learning schedule following their regular school day? Um, I'm not sure if I understand your question, Lisa. What about homework submissions? Homework will be done the same way that it was done um, you know, online. Most of these things will be able to be uh, handled digitally. Um, uh, be with the teacher all day. So like do like a full day of, of online learning if, if we have to, okay. Um, Probably not, and and uh, yes, prep does do it um, at the high school level. Um, that's probably a, a, a little bit different of of, an, of a situation. And I think certainly we can look at um, you know by the end of last year we had across the board you know certainly in middle school and I know you've got a, a rising eighth grader. Um, we we uh, we had kids online you know about three hours a day in, in middle school you know with rotating subjects um, and so we felt that that was healthy um, being online on a full um, I will say I've I've spoken I, I spoke with a gentleman from prep recently and we we were just chatting a little bit about the process of you know co 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 commiserating over the um, the distance learning thing and he said you know one thing that kids do get pretty good at though is is learning how to um, uh, tune off even though they're even though the, the, the computer's on. And so what we really focused on at our age, we felt developmentally, um, you know, about three hours, four hours tops a day of, of you know, uh, digital learning, online learning, live, um, was probably the most we could ask and get and get real genuine engagement at that point. Um, but then they still had work to do outside of those hours. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know about you, but I will, I will also tell you that, you know, I, I do, I feel like I do about seven Zoom meetings a day and I have seen people, they have gotten very good at, oh, I'm having technical difficulties and they come back with a cookie. Yeah, technical difficulties. So, you know, I think we learn how to navigate this whole online experience pretty well and kids are far more savvy than we are. So I think that just de developmentally, we did not feel like an eight hour day online um, was the right thing for our kids at their age, but they will still engage. They will absolutely be. And, and I know Dr. Hurt, you know, you, you managed to, to do a, an online program at your school. At Saint, she was actually the principal of a St. Raphael out in Los Angeles where you guys did distance learning. So this is not new to Dr. Hurt and she'll be able to, uh, to, to help to guide us if we have to go into, um, into distance learning. Um, but I just think developmentally at sixth, seventh, eighth grade, we don't wanna do a, a seven hour day online. But I'm, it's certainly something we can discuss, but that, that was our thinking behind it. All right. 
Okay, everyone. So it's 707. You have really hung in there with me. <laughs> um, I'm going to let you go. Uh, but again, don't feel like you missed your chance to ask your questions. Uh, you absolutely can still uh, send emails out to your principals and to me. Um, and we're going to continue to evaluate. And if we come up with a, a third, a third, uh, you know, scenario that we hadn't thought of, and it's the one that just, you know, manages to, to fill all of our needs, then we will absolutely adopt it. Um, but until then, um, you know, this is, these are the two contingencies that we're, that we're looking at. So we're just going to end um, with a, a prayer. And again, um, I thank all of you for your time this evening and, uh, and, and to stay in communication with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Most merciful and triumph God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust. You alone are our hope. We place before you the sickness present in our world. We turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors, give understanding to scientists, endow caregivers with compassion and generosity. Bring healing to those who are ill, protect those who are at most risk. Give comfort to those who have lost a loved one. Welcome those who have died into your eternal home. Stabilize our communities, unite us in compassion. Help us to all use the information at our disposal to make the best decision for ourselves, for our children, and for our school. Fill us with confidence in your care. Jesus, I trust in you, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, I wish you all health and happiness, and I look forward to seeing you all very, very soon, as, as long as that remains the safe option to do. Um, you, please know that you will be hearing from us very soon with more information as it becomes available, and, and from your teacher, or from your principals, as we look for the specifics of, of coming back to school on your particular campus. So God bless all of you, and again, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you.